before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, you guys. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and we are continuing our deep dive into this Pesor conspiracy or legend that has pretty much haunted us for a few years now. Now, before we get into it, I just want to make something very clear to the new subscribers on this channel. I've gotten some snarky remarks about some of these conspiracies. Like, I don't know anything i don't know about bloodline families all this kind of stuff first of all you must be new here because for four years this is pretty much all that we've talked about now don't confuse the fact that i try to practice discernment with information as me being ignorant to information here's the thing my friends here's the kicker it is so easy during this great awakening for all of us myself included to get an ego thinking that we know something that somebody else doesn't know, or that for some reason, our train of thought is better than somebody else's. And I think I said this last week, but I just want to like, my kind of perception and the way I try to practice with myself during this time of great awakening is to remain humble. Because here's the thing, you guys, again, most of us on this channel know that the media is lying to us whether you fall on the left or the right they're all it's just one big propaganda machine we all know that we know that so in knowing that in knowing that we need to research stuff why do we then and i'm just generally speaking get on these youtube platforms or rumble and believe what all these youtubers or content creators are saying without fact checking them as well or researching them as well does that make sense so if you've replaced like cnn or fox news with youtube have you really woken up does that make sense and i think it's really easy for us to fall into confirmation bias like when we hear somebody say what we want them to say or hear what supports our opinions it's so easy to be negligent at that point and to not do the research. And I'm talking about myself as well. It's something I have to work on too. And so with that being said, when I talk about this, this Pesor legend, even though I'm pretty sure that there is a conspiracy here, I also want to take everything with a grain of salt because we don't have all the information. And with that being said, it is not fair. Listen, when I say this, it is not fair. And it is not just, there's no justice when we just go vigilante on people just because of their last name or because of some conspiracy behind bloodlines. Now, let me also re reiterate this. Every single person on this planet is a part of a bloodline, right? So when you talk about bloodline families, what are you really talking about? Yes, there are establishment families. There are families that have been in control. But that, again, does not mean that every single member of that family has made the choice to participate in the antics of their family members. And we have to be fair about that. I find it very dangerous when people state opinions as facts. It's very dangerous. We're in very dangerous territory when we start saying, that that this is true or that is true when at this point it's just of an opinion 
right? There's not enough. It's a high probability that some things are true, but there's not enough to really make a probability a fact. I hope that makes sense. I also want to reiterate the fact that human beings, I've been saying this a lot lately, human beings are complex. It is very dangerous to paint something black or white. In fact, painting things black and white is part of borderline personality disorder, which is a wicked personality disorder that causes more harm than good. So I have noticed this hardcore in like the truther community where people are just going around painting people black and white. And this is very dangerous. And in my opinion, this is what the controllers of the world want us to do. Because you know full well that the controllers of this world, the establishment, has also infiltrated the truther community too. So ask yourself, are my opinions opinions that I'm treating as facts? And if so, is that causing me to cause harm or aggression or violence towards my fellow man? We are in very delicate times right now. And I think what's so important to make sure we're going in the right direction as a collective is that we have some self-awareness, that we check ourselves, that we respond to things with grace and mercy, that we hear people out, that we always take our own opinions and our own thoughts with a grain of salt. So, with that being said, if you're one of those people that gets in my comment section and starts to act all snarky, like you think I'm dumb or something because I'm not stating this stuff as fact, cut it out. Because in my opinion, you're doing exactly what the enemy wants you to do. And I will say to you, to, my, to everybody watching, if you dig back far enough in your family line, you got some shady people there too. So judge not, least ye be judged. Please be careful about saying your opinion as fact. Please remember, if you want to be better than the other side of this, then behave better than the other side of this. All right, before we get into the Marquis de Lafayette, I do want to give a quick recap for those of you guys who are joining us for the first time. As always, our past episodes will be down in the description box below if you would like to watch them. Otherwise, hold tight for a quick recap. If you don't need a recap, feel free to go ahead and skip ahead. Okay, so who are the Paysors? Basically, Cliff Notes version, during the French Revolution, there were, were a group of royalists to the House of Bourbon who decided, especially after Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette met their fate at the guillotine, they decided to extract their son, Louis Charles, eight-year-old child, out of the jail and take him into hiding so that one day he could resume the throne as Louis XVII. Subsequently, when his father, Louis XVI, was at the guillotine, Louis Charles did actually become Louis the 17th, hence why when the Bourbons were brought back to power a few decades in the from this point, um, Louis the 18th, which was uh, Louis the 16th's brother, took the 18th and not the 17th, because technically Louis Charles was the 17th. Now, the big conspiracy is whether this actually happened or not, because 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 we know history has history has told us that Louis Charles actually got very sick. He was given adopted out to another family, and he ended up passing away at a very young age, where he was buried as Louis Charles. The daughter Marie Theresa was taken out into exile, but we don't really need to worry about her because she's a girl, and you know, at this time, only boys could inherit the throne. But we're just going to exile her. All right. So here's the thing. This is the conspiracy. So the, the loyalist or royalist who took Louis Charles out of the prison, extracted him out as the legend states, don't know if it's true or not, as the legend states, replaced Louis Charles with one of his cousins who was already sick, which to me is kind of messed up. Nonetheless, they replaced him with one of his cousins where his cousin actually was the one who died a few years later. Louis, uh, Louis Charles spent a few years kind of gallivanting around France with protectors. He went to a war in Egypt where his protector passed away and left Louis Charles with about a million dollars. At this point, Napoleon gets wind, as, as according to the legend, Napoleon gets wind that Louis Charles is still alive. 
uh oh, because that means that there is actually a bloodline of the Bourbons who could be placed on the throne. And that's what Napoleon is trying to discourage because Napoleon, er, he wants to be the emperor. So at this point, uh oh, his protectors go, crap, what are we going to do? Napoleon knows he's alive. And so at that point, they contact Queen Charlotte, who is King George III, Mad King George, who just lost the American Revolution. They contact them and be like, yo, we've got this kid. He's actually your cousin Charlotte, because Queen Charlotte was related to Marie Antoinette. So they send Louis Charles to the court of Great Britain. Because family. It's family. And so at this point, King George III and Queen Charlotte devise this scheme right? They're going to send Louis Charles to America, not to live the American dream. They're just going to keep him there for a little bit until he can be returned to his rightful place on the throne of France. But we got to have a cover story. So nonetheless, there's this dude named George Pesor who's in the court of England. Now, George Pesor, he used to work for the Bourbon family. He was what they called a weight master. That's what Pesor means. Basically, weighing gold and silver, he was an accountant, he basically, that's a fancy way, say he paid the bills. So he already knew the Bourbons. And so they devised this scheme that George was going to adopt Louis the Char adopt Louis the Charles, not officially. He was going to be his son, Daniel. So then, then, because history really doesn't change that much, King George III decides that he is going to forge his father's signature. I love this part of the story. Y'all, I mean, I say this almost every episode. We all forged our parents' signatures, didn't we? And so did King George III, because here's the kicker, my friends. Before the American Revolution, the court of England was able to allot land to certain nobility. After the American Revolution, they couldn't do that anymore because it wasn't theirs anymore. And so what they decided to do, because the American government was really kind, and they said, you know... We're just going to let people keep the land. Like if, if you were granted land by the English crown before the American Revolution, it's cool, bro. You can keep it. We're just going to grandfather you in. So King George, in order to protect Louis Charles, decided to give land to George Pesor in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina. But he had to backdate it to make it look like it was his father. Like he, he signed his father's name. But we know it's a forgery because on this particular note, granting him land, it talks about a county that didn't exist before the American Revolution. Oops. So even kings make typos. Nonetheless, they get to North Carolina. We've got these suspicious activities with Michelle Ney, who was a general for Napoleon, who apparently was by the people. But apparently he actually was sent to North Carolina to kind of be a handler, it sounds, for Daniel. And then we got this pirate named Jean Lafitte who also ends up kind of in the same area, maybe as a handler. We have one one scene from last week where Michelle Ney, allegedly going by the name Peter Stewart Ney, and Lafayette, or, uh, Lafitte, who was going by Lorenzo Ferrer, like kind of duke it out, like with words, though, not like, but like words in the middle of the town, kind of yelling at each other in French. Meanwhile, just for, for our new audience members, you might be thinking, wait, 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 wait. Wasn't it weird that there were like French people in the middle of this small town in Southern America because it was an English colony? No, 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 no. That's why he sent them to North Carolina. New Orleans was not the only place where French people went. The Southeast, most of us have English and French blood. Lots of Huguenots down here. I have lots of French in me. Even though my last name is Watson, I got a lot of French in me. Okay, so a lot of, there were a lot of French speaking people down here in the Southeast who were coming to English colonies because they were Protestants, all right? So super not weird, not weird at all in the 1800s. It might be a little strange now to have people arguing in French because nobody speaks French down here anymore, unless in their own home or unless you're in New Orleans where it's mostly Creole anyway. Um, but back then in like the, the 1800s, early 1800s, would not have been uncommon. To, see, to hear people speaking French or German um, who had just like immigrated, you know, the, these thriving French communities. So no, was it weird to have these two French dudes like arguing in the street at all? So anyway, now we've got this connection to the Marquis de Lafayette, who again is a super big American hero. All these weird circumstantial evidence, we don't know for sure. I 
we don't know for sure if Peter Stewart Nay was Michelle Nay. You'll have to watch that episode and come to your own conclusion. I really do think Lorenzo Ferrer was in fact Jean Lafitte. And we have so much in the South. As I said last week, there's so much pirate culture down here in the South. Like we are all, most of us are descendant of pirates too. Um, so, so lots of pirate stories down here. So as I've said before, th stuff like this is why I opened my channel. Like this juicy stuff. And this is the South, y'all. This is the eccentricity of the South. Nonetheless, so here we are. We've got this boy named Daniel Pesor who lives in North Carolina with his dad, George Pesor, who people think is actually the lost, the lost Dauphin, Louis Charles. Now, as you might know, Louis Charles never made it back to the throne. So we don't know if this guy was actually... Louis Charles or not. We don't know. We don't know. We also don't know. I mean, even if Daniel Pesor wasn't Louis Charles, it doesn't mean that he's not nefarious. And it also doesn't mean if he was Louis Charles, it doesn't mean he's nefarious either. Like, there's so many circumstantial evidence here. Anyway, but nonetheless, this is the juicy story of the Pesor family. And um, let's get into the next section on the Mar Marquis de Lafayette. Okay, with that being said, we're going to be talking about the Marquis de Lafayette today um, with our book of Daniel. If you um, are interested in this book, written by Stephen Pesor, link is down in the description box below, along with our past episodes on this. And um, again, this is obviously a self-published book. I actually really like this guy, even though there's a lot of typos in it and stuff like that, whatever. I really like this guy, and I actually appreciate him putting together all of his um, own research on his own family for us to look through and and expand upon and so um yeah with that being said again the link is down in the description box below i think this guy's quite funny he was funny in the beginning and it's interesting some of the stuff that he has brought up i mean um last week we spoke about jean lafitte and i've actually reached out i'm hoping to hear back from them i've reached out to the mother-daughter team that I, I tagged their video in the description box below, they wrote a book about Jean Lafitte and the conspiracy that he actually faked his own unaliving and then went off to North Carolina and lived a very long life. There's a lot of stuff that they found that really it does kind of make it seem that this is a, a high probability that this is what happened. I have reached out to them, so I'd love to bring them on my channel to explore Jean Lafitte a little bit more. Um, so hopefully I will hear back for them. Hopefully I will hear back from them. Um, but nonetheless, today we move on to the Mar Marquis de Lafayette. Now, most Americans watching this um, probably already already familiar with the Marquis de, Ma de Lafayette. Um, probably a lot of my French viewers are very familiar with the Mar Marquis de Lafayette because this dude was a, a hero in both the American Revolution as well as in France. And so that's who we're talking about. Lafayette is a big name here in the United States, in saying that most states, if I were a gambling girl, I would bet that every single state in the union probably has a Lafayette, at least a town called Lafayette or a county called Lafayette. This is where the name come from, so the Marquis de Lafayette. So just before we get into Stevens information on the Marquis de Lafayette. I want to go ahead and just give some brief information about him for some of our viewers who are not familiar with him. He was born on the 6th of September 1757 in France. He was a French nobleman and military officer. He played a huge part in the American Revolution. He came over and like really helped the American colonists win the revolution. In fact, it is said that he highly really believed in the concept of America and the concept, which is, which is ironic, right? Because he was a nobleman, but he believed in this concept of, of the people ruling, right? And the people of having no monarchy. So that I find that very interesting, but again, people are complex, right? There's a complexity within everyone. All right. He, after the American revolution, he went back to France and joined the French revolution in 1789 and the July revolution of 1830. Now some, some accounts say that after he helped George Washington, win the American revolution, he was granted like honorary citizenship, I don't know how all that worked back then. I, I 
I mean, people were coming and going. There was no, I mean, as far as like visas and paperwork and all the stuff that we deal with today, that really wasn't much of a thing back then, especially in the 18th century. Of course, getting closer to the 20th century, people started having paperwork, but it was so much easier for people to immigrate to other countries way back then than it is now. So whatever, you know, <laughs> but anyway, now let's get into the Marquis de Lafayette. In this book, Stephen gives his full name. I'm just going to refer to him as the Marquis de Lafayette because that's how most people know him. And it's so much easier to say than the mouthful of the name that he he's, he has. So if you are reading along with the book, you'll see that I'm just going to call him the Marquis de Lafayette. All right. So chapter six, the Marquis de Lafayette. Just about every school kid knows the name Lafayette in America, that is. He was one of the many heroes of the Revolutionary War and probably the most famous participant who was not American. He was born in the South Central France in 1757 and was less than 21 years old when he came to America to serve under George Washington. All right. So, of course, Marquis was his, de Lafayette was his noble title. I know his parents died young, so he inherited the wealth of his family and the titles at a very young age. Now, this is interesting because I have read ahead, and I think this is definitely a typo for sure, because Stephen goes on to say his lineage goes back for quite some time. Some time, his father, Gilbert de Lafayette, led an army with Joan of Arc in the Battle of Orleans. Now, Joan of Arc lived in the 15th century, in the 1400s. And the Marquis de Lafayette was born in 1757 like 300 years. So the Marquis and Joan of Arc are separated for a, from a, a estimate about 300 years. So I don't think it was his father who led an army with Joan of Arc. I don't know if, if um, Stephen meant to say like great, great, great grandfather or something, because that's confusing to me. If you guys can clarify that down in the comment section below, let me know. Again, I, I just assume this was a typo. Let me read it again. His lineage goes back for quite some time. His father is how it's written. Gilbert de Lafayette led an army with Joan of Arc in the Battle of Orleans. Again, Joan of Arc lived in. Just let me know what you think about that in the comment section below because obviously the, the, the dates aren't matching unless his father was like a 300-year-old vampire, which could be a possibility you know that doesn't the math ain't mathing on that one so let me know what you think about that if you think it was like or if you're from france and you're familiar with this family because i know he's famous in france as well let me know your thoughts on that um it is also said that another of his ancestors acquired the crown of thorns during the sixth crusade in jerusalem now we, that's interesting to me because we have covered the crown of thorns on this show before I think we covered it. I'll tag it down below. I think we covered it before I did the missing books of the Bible. So I know my opinion has probably changed since then. Um, because we, of course, we know from the missing books of the Bible that Yahshua, the real guy, was never crucified. That that's a totally fabricated story. Um, going back to the Dionysian cult of Zeus, which is, which is where the name Jesus comes from. Hail Zeus or Satan, right? So, but I, nonetheless, I'll tag that down in the description box below because I am not ashamed to say that my mind has changed, right? Anyway, but if there is, if his ancestor was in search of holding the crown of thorns because he thought it was valuable, and we've got other ancestors fighting with Joan of Arc, and now he becomes a big wig, that's just very interesting to me. All right. When he was married, he... when. He, when he was 16, he married marie andre Francois de Nolis. No no I hope I'm saying that right. She was, we'll say, Mrs. Marquet de, de Lafayette. She was the daughter of a duke in France and a distant relative of King George III of England. And dukes are like princes. They're kind of that same stature as a prince. So his wife obviously has ties to if you want to say a bloodline family, even though we're all, she has ties to the establishment. They both do. So that's interesting, right? All right. During the Revolutionary War, Lafayette began as an aide to General Washington on the recommendation of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin, which we spoke about prior, was then serving as an ambassador to France and had met Lafayette there. 
Franklin had written letters of introduction for Lafayette before he left for America. On an interesting note, both Franklin and Lafayette were Freemasons. While in Paris, Franklin was active in the Lodge of the Nine Sisters, and it could easily have been that he met Lafayette through his Masonic ties. Washington later made Lafayette a general in the Continental Army, and he fought in many battles. Most notably were the Battle of Brandywine, where he was wounded in the Battle of, at the Battle of Rhode Island. During the war, he returned to France and successfully negotiated French support for the revolutionary cause. When he returned to America, he participated in the Battle of Yorktown, where Cornwallis finally surrendered to General Washington, effectively ending the war. One of Washington's other generals, Benjamin Lincoln, was selected to be the one who accepted Lord Col Corn Cornwallis's sword during the surrender ceremony. When Lincoln County, North Carolina was established in 1789, it was named for General Benjamin Lincoln. And as we've said before, as I've said before, I know that the powers that be have done a really good job trying to get the American people today in modern times and the French people to hate each other. You ever, you ever wonder why that is? Because during the American Revolution, the colonists' greatest supporters were French. And then post-American Revolution, that's when the French Revolution kicked off. So let me tell you something to my French brothers and sisters out there. Do not let them divide us because we are powerful together. The American, Americans and the French, we've moved mountains together. And at this point, all of us around the world, not just the French and the Americans, but the English, the German, everyone and this global phenomenon of an awakening that's happening should be banding together to help each other. Because if history has taught us anything, when the French and the Americans got together, they overthrew the greatest military power the world had ever seen. So I want you French people watching, don't forget that. Because of you, because you helped the colonists, my ancestors, we became free. So the American people owe a huge debt of gratitude to the French people. After the war, Lafayette returned to France and became active in the French political scene. He served as vice chairman of the Estates General and submitted a draft of the Declaration of Rights of the Common Man and of the Citizen. And I have a write-up here about... Um, I'm trying to see where it's from, though, um, about when the uh, Bourbons tried to flee France. Let me read it to you. On the 20th of June, 1791, an unsuccessful plot called the Flight to Varnay nearly allowed the king to escape from France. As leader of the National Guard, Lafayette had been responsible for the royal family's custody. He was thus blamed by Danton for his mishap and called a traitor to the people by Maximilian. These accusations portrayed Lafayette as a royalist and damaged his reputation in the eye of the public. The episode garnered support throughout the country for the Republican movement and polarized the king's supporters. Through the latter half of 1791, Lafayette's stature continued to decline. On the 17th of July, the Corps d'Alier organized an event at the Champs de Mars to gather signatures on a petition which called for a re re referendum on Louis XVI. The assembled crowd, estimated to be up to 10,000, hanged two men believed to be spies after they were found under a platform. All right. So. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the um, escapades of, of Louis the 16th and Marie Antoinette when tension was high. I think they kind of felt it that shit was about to get real and they were about to be. So they did this escape, this escape plan. And I always thought this was kind of funny because a lot of times with the, the establishment, it's their ego that, that is their downfall more than anything. 
And the story that I heard growing up is they were, they were trying to get to Austria where Marie Antoinette's family is from in, in the Habsburgs. And so they're going towards the border and if they probably would have been successful and escaped if they had dressed the part. So meaning if they had dressed like a commoner, right? They would have been able to pass through, but because they were so, I mean, because they were so Versailles, we'll say like, so like opulent, they wore clothing of the monarchy. They, they, they traveled in carts of gold. So it was so easy to spot them. I laugh because we even learn as school kids in the American revolution, that part of the reason why England lost the revolution was because they wore red coats, right? So it's like these obvious things, meaning that people could see them right from a mile away. It, it, these obvious things to us that are common sense don't seem to be common sense to the establishment. And maybe it's because the establishment is so far separated from the common person at this point that they just don't even think about these things as being in reality. But nonetheless, as they're saying here, the Marquis de Lafayette was blamed for the, the 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 royal family trying to escape, right? That they were the custody of the Bourbons was in his hands. Now we do know with the French Revolution that over time, even the people that were starting the revolution ended up getting guillotined as well. Like the French Revolution got way out of hand. Actually, I see that a lot in the truth of the world too today. The same type of vigilante violence where you're just going after everyone without having really reason to. And that's what happened in France as well, is it got destabilized, probably for the same reasons that it was infiltrated, right? And so this chaos ensued. And so even people who were supportive of, of a country led by the people for the people ended up themselves being labeled a traitor. Um you know, and, and that's the interesting thing, thing about the Marquis de Lafayette. Like, he was a super rich kid. Like, when he came to fight for the American um, Revolution, he wasn't paid at all. He just wanted to do it himself. He actually ended up putting up a lot of his own money into soldiers' uniforms and all that kind of stuff. And so you might kind of scratch your head and be like, well, hey, hey, wait a minute. This guy, this guy is from the establishment. Like, what's his deal? What's he doing? And this is where I say humans are complex. Humans are very, very complex. Sometimes we're a little hypocritical too. All of us are. For example, even in our own timeline, how many people do we know in the truther community who are anti-censorship? They hate the censorship. They want freedom of speech, except when it comes to the missing books of the Bible. Well, you can't be anti-censorship if you want things censored. So you see how complex people are? And I think the Marquis de Lafayette, as a human being, is no different than we are today. We also have to look at this idea of, of, look what's going on in our world. Like, look at some of the people in our world who are super wealthy, who are independently wealthy, didn't make their money through any type of corruption. And they're able to now use that power to help the people. I'm thinking about particular people in general. You guys probably know who I'm talking about. Is the Marquis de Lafayette any different? Was he somebody that had money and was able to use that? Money, money, being rich isn't bad. Like we have to also kind of release that idea too. Money is not the root of all evil. The, manip the manipulation of money is the root of evil. Using money against people is the root of evil. But money itself, it's just glorified paper, right? And if you you use it properly, then it's, it can be very prosperous. You know, another hi hypocritical thing we see to kind of explain the complexities. You know, I've said before, so many people are so upset that people like me, content creators who are trying to get to the truth, that we um, make money, that we have sponsorships, um, that we have Patreons. People call us, you know, traders because we're taking money for, for our hours we spend working. Okay. Well, first of all, that's an energy exchange. Second of all, if... YouTube, the platform I'm putting my videos on, and Rumble, those two platforms make money too. So what you're saying is you want YouTube and Rumble to continue to generate an income while the content creators sacrifice everything and become super poor. Do you see how hypocritical that is?
the complexities of that. You've been manipulated to think that if somebody sacrifices sacrifices their time without taking pay, then that's spe somehow spiritually righteous. They had martyred themselves. But meanwhile, what you're actually saying is you're creating a, a bigger division between the haves and the haves not because the platform is going to generate money. It has to in order to keep running, but we shouldn't take money. So therefore the Zuckerbergs of the world get even richer while you want us to get even poorer. Do you understand like why I say there's complexities here? So even though our world is very different in 2024 that it, than it was in the late um, 18th century, there are still these same hypocrisies and complexities. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's keep going. His participation for the monarchy opposing the French Revolution put him in hot water with the Jacobins. He tried to flee to the United States through Holland, but was captured by the Austrians and spent five years in prison there. So again, this is... This is Complexity. So he believes in the American Constitution and this idea that the people should run the government, there should be no monarchy, but yet he's supporting the French monarchy. I guess my point is, he's not necessarily a traitor to either side. He's just a complex human. He's a complex human who might be slightly hypocritical, just like we are. And that's where we need to be fair with other people. I hope I'm making sense with this. I know it's a, com it's a complex idea. Let me know if this is not making sense and I'll try to think of better metaphors or examples. But I just don't see the Marquis de Lafayette as any, really any different than we are. Napoleon finally secured his release from prison Though he refused to become a member of Napoleon's government after the monarchy was restored, he was a member of the Chamber of Deputies in 1815 and served there until his death. In 1824, President James Monroe invited Lafayette to visit the United States as a guest of the government. This was in part to help the na nation celebrate its 50th anniversary. While in the United States, Lafayette toured all 24 states covering almost 6,000 miles. So again, this is another segment from another, another work that he's quoted. Lafayette arrived from France at Staten Island in New York on the 15th of August, 1824, to an artillery salute. The towns and cities he visited included Fayetteville, North Carolina, the first city named in his honor, gave him enthusiastic welcomes. During this tour, he recognized and embraced James Lafayette, a free Negro, who, which is what they called black people back then, guys. That's literally just reading. I don't want people to get upset about that. That's literally the words they used back then to describe the black person. Who took his last name to honor him while in Yorktown, the story of the event was reported by, Richard, by the Richmond Inquirer. On the 17th of October, 1824, Lafayette visited Mount Vernon and George Washington's tomb. On the 4th of November, 1824, he visited Jefferson at Monticello, and on the 8th, he attended a public banquet at the University of Virginia. Subsequently, he accepted an invitation for honorary membership to the United States Jefferson's Library and Debating Society. In late August, 1825, he returned to Mount Vernon. A military unit decided to adopt the title National Guard in honor of Lafayette's celebrated Garde Nationale de Paris. This battalion, later the 7th Regiment, was prominent in the line of march when Lafayette passed through New York before returning to France on the Frigate USS Brandywine. Late in the trip, he again received honorary citizenship of Maryland. Lafayette was feted at the first commencement ceremony of George Washington University in 1824. He was voted by the U.S. Congress the sum of $200,000 in a township of land located in Tallahassee, Florida, to be known as the Lafayette Land Grant. I'm close to that. I'm going to be looking into that because I'm close to that. Lafayette's secretary, Monsieur Lavacheur, kept a diary of their journeys through the United States. Here's some of what he had to say. On the 4th of March, we reached the pleasant little town of Fayetteville, situated on the western shore of Cape Fear River. The weather was ex excessively bad the rain fell in torrents yet the road for several miles before we reached the place was crowded with men and bo boys on horseback and a militia on foot 
The streets of the town were filled with throngs of ladies in full dress, hasting across the little streams of water to approach the general's carriage, and so much accompanied with the pleasure of seeing him that they appeared almost insensible of the deluge, which threatened almost to swallow them up. I just love the way they wrote back then. These ladies were hot for the Marquis de Lafayette. That's what, that's basically what he's saying. Y'all, this one time, this one time, I was in like my mid twenties. I lived in LA at this time. And I went with my boyfriend at the time and a friend to Staples Center to see Bon Jovi. Love me some Bon Jovi. We were like, we were sitting kind of like, up in the stadium but kind of down like right above the ground so it was really great view like you could see right the stage but nonetheless when the concert started john bon jovi like pops up on this little platform in the middle of the audience to play a song and then he gets down to walk to the main stage as he's walking to the main stage all of these women are at this concert granted this is like a generation older than me. Like I was in my mid twenties. Most of the women there were probably in their like their forties by this time, like my age now. They all had like their jersey hair for the like aquanetted the crap out of their hair for the night. Teased it so high, the closer closer to heaven, the closer to God. You know, all these women were married. You know, they were all married. They all had husbands at home or maybe with them. They probably all had kids. As John Bon Jovi walked through that aisle to the main stage these women these middle-aged women were throwing themselves on him like it was kind of embarrassing ladies don't do that don't throw yourself on a guy please let him throw himself on you do not throw yourself on a guy but nonetheless when i read that that is the image i got in my head of, of witnessing this at the john bon jovi concert these women were so hot for the marquis de lafayette they put their best sunday sunday dress on they probably doused themselves in perfume. Didn't matter if it was raining outside. They went outside to see the Marquis de Lafayette, like some unwritten love story. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're probably married. So anyway, I just find that hormones will do crazy things to a person. I find that quite, quite funny. All right, let's continue. This enthusiasm may be more readily imagined when it was uh, recollected that it was expressed by the inhabitants of the town founded about 40 years ago to perpetrate the remembrance of the services rendered by him whom they honored that day. Upon leaving on his way to South Carolina, he offered a toast to the town Fayetteville. May it receive all the encouragements and attain all the prosperity which are anticipated by the fond and grateful wishes of its affectionate and, res and respectable namesake. All his fans, all his fans, he blessed all his fans. After visiting several towns in North Carolina, Lafayette journeyed to South Carolina, visiting the Camden Battleground and also Columbia, among other towns, before moving on to Georgia. In all his travels, it seems that he made a point to visit as many Masonic temples as possible, visiting 24 in all. In Tennessee, this bit of history was uncovered. Our illustrious brother, General Lafayette, was introduced by, by an, our brother Andrew Jackson and G.W. Campbell, received with grand honors and seated on the right of W.W. Grand Master. At the conclusion of the Grand Master's address of welcome, Lafayette made a feeling and an appropriate reply in substance as follows. He felt himself highly gratifying at being so kindly welcomed by the Grand Lodge of Tennessee and being made an honorary member of that lodge, which he had been introduced to by the distinguished brother Mason, who had erected the lines of New Orleans, and in technical language of the craft, had made them well-formed, true, and trusty. He had, he said, been long a member of the order, having been initiated young as he was, even before we, he entered the service of our country in the Revolutionary War. Now, again, is it suspicious that he visited all these Masonic lodges? Yes, it is suspicious. Does it mean anything? Not necessarily. Because we know from whistleblowers that if you join a Masonic lodge, you're not actually going to know what you're doing, what's really happening until you get to what, like the 33rd degree. So again, this is where we have to be fair with people. Now, again, 
I've said it many times. I have a lot of Freemasonry in my, in my lineage, my mom's family, as well as my dad's family. I've talked about that in my deep dive on the Bennett's. I will put that in the description box below. If you missed it, I'm not afraid or ashamed to admit that because you, you can't control what your ancestors did. Right. And again, humans are complex. So we can't blame somebody because they're a part of a family. All four corners of my family had a lot of wealth, a lot of privilege. They were all Masons. Were they doing shady stuff? Probably. Maybe not. I don't know. But that's not my karma. I'm Bryce. I have my own free will choice. So this is yet another example why we can't just tarnish people because of things that are out of their control. I'll ask you watching if you're having a hard time contemplating this. What if you found out, like I did, that your two times great-grandfather, one of them, was a high wizard, a master wizard warlock in a Masonic Lodge? My two times great-grandfather, Stanley Bennett, was just that. Now, I never knew Stanley. He died long before I was born. But he, I am a direct descendant of him. I can't go back and control the fact that he did that. I know that his son, who's my great-grandfather, who I did know that he died when I was a kid. I have a few memories of him. I know he wasn't a, ma a master mason. And I didn't know that about Stanley. I didn't know he was like this grand wizard warlock. I mean, that was in paperwork. Like, he was proud of it. I didn't know that until Bobby started researching my family line, that particular family line. So for you watching, there is a high probability that you have a direct descendant or direct ancestor that also was like a high wizard warlock in the Freemasons. And so if you're one of those pointing your finger at people and telling people that certain people should be unalive because of their family, stuff that's out of their control, then I beg you, look in your own family. Can you control that? Were you able to control that? No. Should you be held responsible for that? No. Lafayette loved the United States, and he particularly loved George Washington. On his tour of America, he stopped at Mount Vernon to pay his respects at Washington's tomb. It is said that when he died in France, soil from Washington's, Washington's tomb was placed on his grave. And actually, it's interesting, when I was listening to some podcasts before doing this on Lafayette, there were a lot of, there are a lot of people who believe that because Lafayette's own father passed away so young, that he saw George Washington almost as like a surrogate father. So take, take with that what you will. So where does Lafayette fit in with Daniel Pesor? The connections are circumstantial. The obvious connection would be their French connection if, in fact, Daniel Pesor was the lost Dauphin. Since both would have been French royalty, there would have been at least one sympathetic leaning by Lafayette towards the former crown prince. Lafayette was a royalist, as what is evidenced by his refusal to join Napoleon's government. Again, the complexity, right? Here he was supporting the American Constitution, which said, no, mon no monarchy, we're all given certain inalienable rights by our creator, but yet he supports the French monarchy. Very complex, right? Lafayette was in the French military, at one time commanded the Grand National, this would have given him the opportunity to have met Marshal Michel Ney. They could have perhaps been members of the same Masonic Lodge, since the evidence shows that both were likely active Freemasons. Lafayette was introduced at the Masonic Lodge in Tennessee by none other than Andrew Jackson. As you recall, Jackson was the commander who defeated the British at the Battle of New Orleans with the help of privateer, a.k.a. pirate, Jean Lafitte. Lafitte himself was French and purportedly lived in Lincolnton, North Carolina. These connections would seem to make it at least plausible that during Lafayette's tour of the United States that he met with Daniel Pesor. Whether that meeting took place in Lincoln County or more likely at a spot nearer to one of the towns he visit cannot be proven. Perhaps a side trip by both men would have been possible somewhere near Lincolnton and either Columbia or Camden. 
One town that comes to mind would be Lancaster, South Carolina. I, I have family in Lancaster. Lancaster is about halfway between Lincolnton, either Columbia or Camden. Also, Lancaster does hold some significance, as we'll see later on in the story of the Daniel Paysore family. All right, guys. So next time, we're actually going to look into Daniel Paysor. Um, with that being said, please be kind to each other in the comment section. Once again, please make sure that you realize your your opinions aren't facts right? And so we have to keep an open mind. If we're going to be awake, then we have to stay awake. We can't go back to sleep. All right, you guys, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon.